me. Here's the format. Each candidate will have three minutes to give an opening statement. Throughout the debate, the first candidate to speak will have the ability to back time. For instance, Mr. Stimson will go first in making his opening statement. He has three minutes. If he only spends two minutes, he will have one minute that he could use to reply to anything that Mayor Jones said. After the six minute opening, there will be 12 questions. Each of the candidates answer each question. They'll have two minutes to do so. As with the opening, the first one to answer the question has the right to bank time. You get two minutes for the question. So, for instance, if Mr. Jones, Mayor Jones, pardon me, if Mayor Jones in responding to the first question used one minute, he would have reserved one minute to reply to what Mr. Stimson said. After the 12 questions have been asked, and six of those questions were gathered by Samuel Forbes, who also was instrumental with Mike and I in putting it in working on this, Mike Marshall and I, and then six questions came from the general membership of Mobile United. After those 12 questions have been answered, and we've got one alternative additional question, just in case we have a little more time. But after that, then the candidates will each have three minutes to make their closing remarks to you. So we're using a total of one hour. And in the closing remarks, once again, the speaker to speak first, and that will be Mayor Jones, would have the right to back time. We've got rules. Three primary rules for the candidates. Number one, when your time is up, quit speaking. We've got timekeepers, and we're going to try to do this in one hour from start to finish. The second rule, please answer the question. I've been instructed, and I, I, I don't want to do this, but I've been instructed that if an answer is not responsive, that I should interrupt and politely say, excuse me, that, that's not responsive. And I certainly don't want to have to do that. The third rule is that if your answer requires spending money, then you ought to tell us whether you're going to raise that money by cutting taxes, and if so, where, or by, or, 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 I'm sorry, you're going to raise that money by increasing taxes, or by cutting a program, what you're going to do. Now, I will not prompt one of the speakers to tell us where you're getting the money. But the candidates are invited to point that out if they've got time for rebuttal or in their closing if we've got a bunch of unfunded mandates. Those are the rules. The opening statements are three minutes. Mr. Stinson will go first. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here tonight because Mobile United's mission may best exemplify what it means to be one mobile. I'm running for mayor because I'm very concerned about our city. As I've looked around our city over the last several years, I see missed opportunities, crumbling infrastructure, poorly maintained parks, and streets on which our citizens don't feel safe. Mobile is at a crossroads. The most troubling indicator of what lies ahead for Mobile is our declining population. While similar cities like Charleston and Savannah are growing, Mobile is shrinking. Right now, our city's most valuable export item. Our children graduating from high school and college can't find opportunities in Mobile. They are leaving to find jobs in other cities and the quality of life that they seek. This has got to stop. 
The leadership at City Hall has set up for mediocrity, but our citizens will not. We know that we can do better. It is time that we have a mayor who listens. It is time that we have a mayor who gives priority to hiring the talent and the ingenuity of local individuals and companies. It's time we had a mayor who quits telling us reasons why we can't do things. And finally, it's time that we had a mayor who represents everyone, everyone regardless of what neighborhood they live in. So let's set our goals high. Let's take claim to a bold vision. Let's set a course to become the safest, most business and family-friendly city in America by the year 2020. We can do this through servant leadership, true transparency, collaboration with the city council. We will unite Mobile from Tillman's Corner, Dalton Island Parkway to Trinity Gardens, downtown through Midtown to Spring Hill, and into West Mobile. When we do that, we will be one Mobile.
obviously there's a difference in the way of interpreting the population decline. I think even with the annexation that we can find that the city is not larger uh, than it was. Also, regarding the API report uh, that the mayor uh, refers to, it also says that Mobile, then that same report says Mobile has the second largest population loss. It has the second highest tax burden on its citizens, and we increase spending while we're decreasing the population. The first two questions deal with public safety. Have crime reports been significantly falsified? And if so, what would you do to prevent falsification of crime reports in the future? Well, obviously, the issue of crime reports is uh, tremendously important. It's not just important to the men and women who wear the uniform, but it's also important to the uh, citizens. And the reason is, is those statistics are used to make you understand uh, how you feel and whether you're being protected. You know, recently it's come out that uh, those uh, the statistics are not correct. And uh, so that gives me pause to say that we need to know what is truly going on. Regardless of what the statistics say, though, our citizens do not feel safe. They do not feel safe. I'll just ask you, do you feel any safer in your neighborhood today or walking in the streets at night? So the, the recording of statistics at the police department starts to think with the integrity at the, the mayor's office. And the mayor needs to make sure that everyone in city government understands that we're going to do things with integrity and honesty. And we're not going to fudge numbers to make us feel better or to look better. And so on the very first day of office, I think that there would be an understanding with the chief of police, you know, that this is how things are going to be going forward. And so that's what we do. Yes, sir. Have crime reports been significantly falsified? And if so, what would you do to prevent falsification of crime reports in the future? First of all, that's the determination of whether crime reports have been falsified has not been reached. There's a full review going on on that. And so far, there were seven incidents out of 1,000. And of those seven, it's very questionable whether they were because reports are often changed by the technician supervisor as policemen bring them in to the office. So to say that crime reporting has been intentionally falsified is the furthest thing from the truth. What has actually happened is that we, within the Mobile Police, Mobile Police Department, found that we saw what we thought was some irregularity in one precinct out of five. And when we saw that was irregularity, we decided to then look at every precinct based on what we saw at this particular precinct. We continue to do that. We continue to look at that. But what we've done here with this question and the answer to this question, we've questioned the integrity of everybody who wears that police uniform. That's what we've done. And it's unwarranted because we have not made a determination as to what caused the discrepancy we see. We have to look at thousands of reports. We have to review thousands of reports that people bring in as well as talk to citizens who file them in order to find the facts. And I think we do our police department and in our top city a great disservice by manipulating information that comes to you from us. It did not come from anybody else. We pointed that out at the city of Mobile. And we have continued to point out when we see errors. But we would reserve the right to effectively and fairly investigate them before we reach any conclusion on what caused that report. It could be, and by the way, our statistics were not based on what was found. The reporting for that era was not even complete yet, so it's not really important. Your time is up. Yes, um, I understand that the investigation is going on, and I understand that the police department has an internal affairs uh, group that's perfectly capable of doing that. 
But you know, uh, because it is, and I've been accused of this, uh, using this political game, and I assure you it's not a political game, but there are policemen uh, who have sent me emails, there are policemen that have stepped up and said, uh, this is not just a situation where there's seven uh, uh, reports that have been uh, altered. There are many more than that. And so I look forward to the day that the full report is done, full investigation is done, and it would be really neat if it was done before the election. Our second question also involves public safety. Is there a real crime problem in Mobile or merely a perceived crime problem? And what will you do to change that? It is our position that there's a lot more perception than reality in our crime situation. Uh, we enjoy right now a 10-year low in most areas of crime in the city of Mobile. Now, anyone that wants to look at that, welcome to look at that. The issue is rather we can convince people that everything they see on TV doesn't happen in Mobile. We see incidents that happen in all we have that we get credit for. We have over a 90% clearance rate on anything we investigate. We have a substantial decrease in what we're responding to because of some of the new initiatives. We've just put in a new initiative, Operation Impact, that's arrested 3,500 people since July. It has had a tremendous impact on crime. And the other part of it is crime prevention. Our crime prevention efforts are working. They are community efforts. And we put enough resources out there to make that happen. So we think it's more of a perception than actually what is taking place. And we plan to deal with that. We do plan to deal with the perception. We want to go out to our community care group and show people just what is happening. Those Our third question. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> the question, is there a real crime problem in Mobile or merely a perceived crime problem and what would you do about it? Well, I think it's a real crime problem. You ask the families of the three people that were murdered last week. You ask if any victim of uh, violent crime, whether it's real to them. And regardless of what the statistics are, if you're a victim of a crime, it's 100% as far as you're concerned. I had a young man call me the other day, recently graduated from Spring Hill College, and he said, you know, my friends told me to leave Mobile, but I decided to stay. I moved to Dolphin Island Parkway. While I was at work, two times in a week, my door is kicked in. You know, he said, I don't know if I can stay here. I met a Baptist youth minister the other day. He said, I lived in Midtown. He said, they broke into my car and my house, and he said, I moved to Sarah Lane. Crime problem is a real problem in Mobile. What are we going to do about it? I think it takes a change of mindset of how you're going to address it. We have these programs that are in place, and uh, you know I just have to say that they, they can be done better. But you have got to focus more on prevention. You've got to uh, give the police the tools and resources they need to do the job instead of driving around cars that are six years old and 200,000 miles on them. And then you've got to help rehabilitate those that are incarcerated and getting ready to get out so that they can make a positive contribution back into society. Operation Impact. Mary just said we, we've done 3,500 arrests. You know, Operation Impact is, is a, if you read about Operation Impact, not in Mobile, but just across the country, we've got programs like this. That's just a feel good program. And what I mean by that is what they're doing is they're recycling those that they're catching. 70% of the people that are going uh, into the county jail come back uh, and go through it again. And the reason is that we're not doing anything to solve the problem. So yes, perception is a crime is a problem. Reality, crime is a problem. Our policemen are not judged. We arrest people, we put them in jail, and if they get out, it's based on the order of the court. We don't have any control over that. We agree with that. We agree that they should stay in. 
but we have to follow the law. And if the law lets them out, then we have to deal with that based on what the law of the land is. Uh, we do have a revolving door situation at the state level, at the local level, and it's basically because of the laws in the state of Alabama as it relates to arrest people. It has nothing to do with police officers. It has nothing to do with police department. The other thing that I would say is that this problem of perception is a problem of people saying because someone had their door broken in, everybody's going to have their door broken into. We don't have a zero cause of crime, but we do want to have a goal to get to it. Your time's up. saying that there's no great city unless it has a great downtown. And the effort to make downtown great is certainly one that we all need to embrace. Uh, the the form-based code, which comes from Andrew's Dwight, is certainly something that needs to be embraced and it needs to be implemented uh, with the support of America as quickly as it can be. Uh, when it comes to the blight, you know, I wonder why it's taken eight years to address the blight downtown. It's been, been there for a long time. And the entertainment district, uh, while I think that it was well intended uh, in the way it was even approached, I think the consequences are not necessarily what we had hoped for because it seems to not be fair to those to everybody that's within that district. So yes, I support the uh, form-based code, the laundry warning plan. Uh, I am definitely about getting rid of the blight, and I think that maybe the entertainment district needs to be revisited. Would you like to read the question? Uh, yes, we've been getting from in a different answer. I don't know the question is going to be. That wasn't a but <laughs> Downtown Mobile has recently seen entertainment districts passed, a blight initiative implemented, and is debating a new form-based code. How do you feel about these programs, and what would you do for Downtown Mobile? The entertainment district uh, was a program that was developed by the city council, passed by the city council, and has been implemented by the mayor. That's the way city government works. Uh, we feel like the entertainment district, and we gave a lot of input to it. We had some exceptions to what was uh, being actually proposed for it, but the council decided to pass it the way it was. At that point, then we only have the responsibility of actually enforcing the law, which we do. Uh, the entertainment district can be a very viable part of what we do downtown if it's properly done. We think there are some things that need to be done now because it's difficult for police officers to enforce it in many cases. Uh, for instance, we have people that go to their car and pour drinks out of their trunk and come up on Dawson Street, and the district wasn't made for that. It was really made for people who were in the establishment downtown to do that. We pointed that out. They were very well done right there. As far as form based code, excellent. Uh, we think it's a great program. It, it will be going to the city council here very shortly. Our planning department just finished reviewing it, and it will be going to the city council. I expect it to pass, and I expect it to be one of the great programs in downtown. As far as blight, we've been sweeping downtown Mobile every year with our regulatory department of urban development. We've given citations. We've had some people go to environmental courts. We've caused people to really completely redo their building as a result of that. So what Mr. Stimpson is talking about is something that we already do and maybe saw us doing. Back, uh, speaking about downtown again, um, to attract young people to our city, it is so, so important to have a, a vibrant, livable, walkable downtown. But if you don't have a safe downtown, you'll never have it evolve into what you want. And so 
when you think about uh, young people coming back to town in a lot of places where they live, you know, lost the farm or whatever, they don't like to walk to work. They want bike paths. They want walking paths. You know, they want, uh, and there needs to be family entertainment down there. But you've got to feel safe in doing it. And so uh, I am very much about improving downtown and everything that the city and the city council can do has got to be done. Mr. Mayor, you kind of foreshadowed this question in your opening remarks. According to the United States Census Bureau, the city of Mobile lost a tenth of a percent of its population between April 1, 2010 and July 2, 2012. How would you propose to reverse that trend? Well, as I said earlier, our pet population loss is from the city limits to the police jurisdiction. We have 65,000 people in the police jurisdiction that the city of Mobile serves today, with public safety and also uh, fire and police. Those are the people who once lived in West Mobile and moved a little farther out, and still the road. And when they moved out there, they still get service, but they live outside the city. There are a lot of reasons for that. Some people move out there because they want Georgia, lots of new subdivisions. There are a lot of reasons for people moving out there. But you know, they still service in Mobile, they still shop in Mobile, they still do a lot of different things in Mobile. So, you know, it's difficult to say just why people left. I've heard people say that they left because of the sales tax. The migration of people from the, to the suburbs started in 2000, before we had any change in sales tax. So that's certainly not the reason for it. And even if you look as far up to 2008, 2009, 2009, um, we didn't have any So we had to migrate from there. So we have a lot of different things that cause people to move to the suburb, and that's in every urban city in the United States. Ours has been targeted because of what's happening here. We've annexed two areas of the city. We have not had annexation before this since 1956. Cities that don't do that have a real problem. For instance, like Birmingham. Birmingham has 39 municipalities that circle Birmingham because they never use that anything. We've done that, we've done it successfully. We think it's good for the community. In fact, we'd like to see more. Would you like to hear the question again? Yes, please. According to the United States Census Bureau, the city of Mobile lost one-tenth of one percent of its population between April 1st, 2010 in July 2nd, 2012. How would you propose to reverse that trend? Not only does the trend need to be reversed, the city has got to grow. It's not about staying where we are and just being average. There are other cities that are growing during the same period of time. And so I will repeat why people are leaving the city. One is that if you don't feel safe, like the uh, gentleman I talked about, the young Baptist minister, uh, leaving Sarah, he left because he didn't feel safe. We also have people leaving because we're not business friendly and, and, and on the uh, level of uh, small businesses. We make it very, very difficult to do business if you're a small business. And people finally get fed up with it, and so they leave. Uh, the third thing is, is the quality of life. You know, if you don't have clean, safe parks, if you don't have the bike trails, you don't have the amenities, you don't have the thriving parks community, then at some point people say, I'm going to go somewhere where they have that. You know, across the bay, the bike trails are just fantastic. They have to just put in a new one. Um, regarding the annexation, yes, there are a lot of cities that reach out and do annexation. But if Mobile does not take care of what's inside the city limits, people will continue to leave. You know, the, the trend when a city starts in decline is that these churches get smaller, the uh, schools get smaller, then the taxes, you know, start eroding. And then there are cities that we can look at around the state and see what happens around the country. Look at Birmingham, look at Pritchard, look at Detroit. You know, that's what's happened. So we can't just say we're going to stop it. We've got to grow it. And the only way we're going to grow it is through dynamic leadership and passion out of the mayor's office.
this and we'll get to the part about you pay for it. Please don't interrupt the candidates. That's not the one. Go ahead. If we are going to deal with the situation as we get, the people, as I said earlier, that migrate out of the city really migrated to the police jurisdiction. So they still get those same city services. You say uh, that they're worried about crime. The same police department who serve them out. They don't have anybody else to serve for the Mobile Police Department. So crime is not the issue. It's certainly not emergency medical service. I'm sorry, you're trying to settle this I'm sorry. Somebody else is my turn. Sign a pledge similar to that promoted by Grover Northwest not to increase taxes and please explain why or why not. I don't want to hamstring myself before I'm elected mayor. Uh, but I would say uh, that until I can get in City Hall and actually see the books and determine what the situation is, then I will make that determination. I can tell you, I think that the tax, the one cent sales tax, uh, the increase in it needs to be rescinded. That would be one of the very first things that we try to do is to rescind that tax. But it's um, crazy for me to stand here and tell you that I'm going to do that when I don't, do not have all the information at hand. Uh, but I can say this, that Mobile, out of the cities in Alabama, as far as the taxes go, we are number 50. We're 50 out of number, out of 50. Okay? We are the, the 10 cities that uh, the mayor would like to speak to about, about the comparison. You know, we were the second highest tax cities. We need to figure out a way to lower taxes. And we can do that. It happens in other cities. And in other cities, when you do that, you know, it does spurt growth. But I'm not going to go in and just a uh, part like and say, we're going to, uh, I'm not going to sign uh, a pledge like that. Should I repeat the question, Mr. Mayor? I think that uh, I don't think that that would be a responsible way to manage the city, to put you in together, with, because you have to provide for services, you have to provide for any disaster that might happen in the city. So to do that really would hamstring the entire city that that took place. I, I think the other thing that we have to pay very close attention to is that, first of all, you don't have to worry about Mr. Simpson, you won't have to worry about uh, whether you going to sign that pledge. You never get to that point. <laughs> the conditions of finances have to do with what you have to do. And when you're in this job, you have to make the decision to run the city and to do what is necessary to provide service. <coughs> So that, that's what anybody there has to do. And you know, nobody wants to raise taxes. I think the big problem is tax reform. We've got a large landlord that don't pay any taxes, and all the rest of us do. The challenge is we can lower sales taxes, increase average taxes, and have a better balance, not just in Mobile, but in the top state of Alabama that's been a problem for years and all over the world. One second, Mr. Well, you know, you, the mayor is responsible for deciding how the money is to be allocated and the revenues that, that are derived. And so, in the last uh, budget, we had to uh, increase the sales tax because we had a $27 million or thereabouts, $27, $30 million shortfall. We will continue to have that shortfall as long as the city is not going. The way to generate more revenue 
is to have people living in the city, spending their money in the city, feeling good about the city, and let the city grow. That's how you, and when it comes back to Mr. Burns about how we're going to pay for these things, the only way that you can pay for them is by growing the city. You cannot do it by raising taxes. The other way of paying for it is to cut waste. So while you're simultaneously growing the city and cutting waste, that's where the money comes from. Mr. Mayor, what do you identify as the major budget problems facing our city, and how do you plan to meet those problems? The major budget problem is uh, the economy has to stand down, local economy. It is not stabilized since we had the downturn, the massive downturn in the economy. We're moving back to where we need to be. Uh, when we, in 2008, we had an unemployment rate of 3.6%. In 2010, we had an unemployment rate of 11.2%. That rate now is about 79 Until we can do something to address that, then we won't have any stability in our revenue base. And we are about to address that. We have spent seven years trying to make sure that we got the kind of industry in here to provide the kind of jobs we can address the unemployment rate. I think in the next three years you'll see us grow to a point where we won't need one success. We won't need a lot of other things because we'll have enough people working and bringing in income, but we'll see our retail sector, and basically for city, the retail sector and automobile sales and those type sales are what bring in revenue to the city. The cities get average on tax, but the bulk of average on tax goes to the school system and the county. That's why I said we need to equalize that sum. But our basic source of income for any city in Alabama, with the exception of Birmingham, because they have an occupational tax, is sales tax. And we can actually see that change when we affect our unemployment rate and see our economy grow. What do you identify? as the major budget problems facing our city, and how do you plan to meet those problems? Um, obviously, the, the major problem is, is uh, the city's stagnant, and we're not generating enough revenue to cover our expenses. And so either you're going to cut expenses, or you're going to increase revenue, like I said earlier. And the mayor uh, pointed out that uh, the economy has had so much to do with where the city is. I Many of you do not know me, uh, you know something about me, but I've been in the uh, lumber business all of my life. The lumber business is a very cyclical business. During the same period of time that the mayor talked about the city declining, my partners and myself, during a period of time when 40% of the sawmills in America shut down and went out of business, my partners and I, we grew the company, we tripled it in size, uh, and we took advantage of the downturn in the economy to do that. I'm also involved with a uh, private school in Pritchard called Pritchard Preparatory School. In the same period of time that the mayor's talked about during this downturn, we tripled the size of that school. You know, you take advantage of what the situation is at hand and you build on it. And we have not done that in the city. As your mayor, those are the things that we will do. We will, we will grow this city with your help with your ingenuity and with your passion. Thank you. Uh, as I said earlier, we, we do have a, a issue with the stability of our economy, just like the national economy. When that economy, the economy stabilizes, we will be fine as it relates to revenue to operate the city. We have really done some things that any other citizen in Alabama has not been able to do. And we are not willing to give up public safety. We're not willing to give up garbage collection to make to actually take place of revenue we're not getting. So we would have to grow the economy. Like each of you, I'm very excited about airports.
move into the part of the, the questions that were submitted by Mobile United members. The first was Mr. Simpson. And this question is from Candy Snipes. For the last several years, police officers have been leaving the city of Mobile for jobs in surrounding jurisdictions because of their, the pay is higher. The city of Mobile trains their officers only to lose them after a few years. Mobile is no longer able to retain experienced officers and can't fill openings fast enough because of employment turnover. What are your plans to remedy that situation? I think that the, one of the primary reasons that we're losing police, police officers has to do with what they're being paid. And it's like the other things that I have mentioned on where is the pay going to come from, it's going to have to come from generating additional revenues, or it's also going to have to come re reorganizing, reassessing your priorities. When you lose 50 policemen a year, that's almost equivalent to a precinct. And we've been losing uh, 50 policemen a year for about the last four years. We have five precincts. So if you want to get on a trajectory of what can happen to crime, when you have police officers, you know, we're uh, 40 or 50 percent of the force uh, are, are, are less, then they're less than four years old, you know, you can figure that out. And so we have got to figure out a way to give the police a raise. I mean, if we don't do anything else, we have got to do that. We cannot be the training ground for Daphne and Spanish Fort and Sarah. And, but it's not just the pay that they're leaving for. It's the work conditions. It's the environment that they're working in, the pressure they feel, uh, because of different things that happen uh, about being required to do certain things. And so that comes back to leadership, and it starts in the mayor's office. And I guarantee you, the policemen will understand that they have a friend in the mayor's office, somebody that will champion their cause day in and day out, whether it's night or dark. I, I mean, day or dark. I, I look forward to working with uh, our police officers. Our attrition in the police department is uh, right below 10%. We got 560 police officers. The turnover of 50 a year, uh, a lot of those are retirement. Some of them are transferred. Some of them go out on disability. There are a lot of different reasons why that happens. We don't have any mass accidents for the police department. They certainly need a ceremony. There's no doubt about that. As well as all the employees of the city, they've gone five years now without salary. And the reason we had to freeze positions in the other part of the city, not public safety, was because we were at a point where we had a $30 million debt. At a $30 million debt, you got to make some decisions. You either keep all the employees on with their benefits, or you start laying them off. To start laying them off, we thought would be disastrous, especially after going four years without a salary. So what we opted to do was maintain the level of benefits, actually hire more officers. We actually have 20 that we're about to bring in now. And we're going to hire some others. Our goal is to get to 600. We're right now at 560. is what we have budgeted for. But the biggest problem with that is being able to give a raise and maintain everybody on the payroll. You have to make some very critical decisions. We opted to keep everybody until we can afford to get everybody away. A moment ago, my exuberance to want to say something about Airbus, what I was going to say is that Airbus really does not solve our, our problems. Yes, it will generate more revenue, but if we don't take and cut the red tape uh, out at City Hall that's encumbering the small businesses, we will not grow as a community. No big company uh, will come in and solve our problems. And so every day that somebody is being constrained because of uh, City Hall red tape there, this is the day we're not directing the tax This question is from Patrick Byrne. As someone who left the area for college and came back after graduation, I feel it's important for Mobile to do everything possible to lure our young people back to the area. 
as mayor, what would you do to promote this city for young professionals to return and start their careers? We would do just what we've done. We have brought major industries in that will have spin-off for suppliers that will create just not hundreds of jobs, but thousands of jobs. A lot of those will be for professionals. And I think young people will have a better opportunity to mobile than they've had in the last 20 years as it relates to opportunities for jobs. That's what you do. You bring in jobs, you bring in ways to allow them to be viable citizens in the community. We've been doing that now. We are going to do it, and over the next few years, you will see thousands of jobs that these young people can come back to. For years, they've had to go other places. I have grandkids. I don't plan for them to be working. I plan to continue to work as hard as we can to build these companies in Mobile, whether they be small business or industry, or whether they be service companies. We have to have a combination of all in order to bring those young people back, in order to attract professionals to Mobile, and I think we're on the road to doing that. I think everybody here knows we're on the road to doing that. As someone who left the area for college and came back after graduation, I feel that it's important for <laughs> Mobile to do everything possible to lure our young people back to the area. As mayor, what would you do to promote this city for young professionals to return and start their careers? At an earlier debate, the mayor made a comment that uh, Mobile had led uh, the state in economic development over the last several years. That is true. We have created over 18,000 jobs, um, but we're not going as a city. Many of our young people still are not coming back to Mobile, and it's about the quality of life. There's another city called Oklahoma City. They decided they weren't going to change economic development anymore. They were going to change the quality of life. And when they changed the quality of life in that community, then people would want to live there. And when the right people live in the community, then the businesses will come. We have done a great job between the Mobile Chamber and the state of Alabama of attracting TK, and we've done a good job of attracting Airbus. But that does not solve our problems. We have got to focus on quality of life, and we've got to do the things that the young people want. They want, they want roads with bike paths. They want jogging paths. They want a vibrant and growing arts community. You know, they want to have an incubator system for uh, startup companies. They want it to be business friendly where it's easy to start a business. And we are not that. But if we take the, again, cut the red tape at City Hall so that we can make it easy to do business, the young people will come back if we improve the quality of life. Yes, we're going to have the jobs, but if we keep chasing jobs and don't change the quality of life, it will be phenomenal. Because they will not live in the city limits. In the quality of life, the first thing anyone who's not rich has to do has to get a job. <laughs> that everyone's a job in the community. But first thing, first, the first thing is to stabilize the individual by offering them a job, a good job. The same time they get it in Atlanta, but the same time they get it in Houston. That kind of job will be in Mobile. And that's the first step to community development, as well as us being able to get other amenities into our city. Sure, we need other amenities. Sure, we need a lot of other things in our city. But you don't do that in a struggling economy with a tax base that's huge because of their factor. You do that by providing opportunities for people to come to your community. That really increases your tax base. You're able then to do all the other quality of life. This question was submitted by Leda Javier Farrell. Do you consider yourself a liberal or a conservative? And how do you feel about the Tea Party platform? <laughs> Here we go. You know, when, this, when this debate, when this uh, race started, um, being a nonpartisan race, you know, people want to put you in a box immediately. 
they want to know whether you're a liberal or conservative. Because if you're not what they are, they're not going to give you a shot. They're going to put you in a box and say you can't do anything. So, you know, I just didn't answer that question. You know? I said, let me talk to you just for a few minutes before I tell you what I'm a liberal or conservative. Uh, so, what I would say is that, you know, our vision is to unite Mobile. It's about bringing Mobile together, regardless of color, regardless of whether you are a Republican or Democrat, regardless of whether you're a liberal or conservative, regardless of what religion you are. And so people say, well, Sandy, you can say that. That's what any politician would probably say, you want to unite everybody. Well, let me say this. At our Monday morning staff meetings, every Monday morning, there's many African Americans sitting there, as there are uh, Caucasians. We have a former president of the NAACP in Jimmy Gardner, the chief of police of Pritchett, sitting there, as well as the Deep Party. And somebody says, how do you keep them from killing each other? And I said, it's very simple. It's not about the ideology. It's about identifying the problems and bringing everybody together to focus on those things that we need to do, that we need to, do to change our city. And so, I will not be controlled by any party's ideology. Uh, I will be controlled by my faith and by my character and by the integrity of my parents and my father's 92 years old sitting here today. Uh, I, those are the things that I will make my decisions based on, not whether I'm a liberal or conservative. Consider yourself a liberal or a conservative, and how do you feel about the Tea Party platform? Let me start with the latter. I don't know people before. <laughs> <laughs> before it's been liberal or conservative, I don't I don't associate that with parties. Because I think in my job, it all depends on what day it is. I could be either. Because in many cases, it requires you to do a little bit of both, but that philosophy of being a particular party doesn't come in play. And even if you wanted it to, it just wouldn't work in America. It just would not work. Because your job is to serve the public, everybody. Regardless of it does not matter, because you can't say, well, I'm not going to serve this person because they're a liberal or that person is a conservative, you've got to serve everybody in the community equally. And you've got to try to provide those services equally. So that, that is not something that is even a fact in being a That is not a fact at all. And quite frankly, that's not a fact in my life, period. Sandy only had four seconds. Mr. Mayor, the next question was submitted by Robert Greer. What do you feel is the most important issue that, if solved, would improve the city of Mobile? And if Mayor, how would you go about solving that issue? You know, I've consistently said that one of the things that's always been an issue for me, something that I always think about, is that we have a perception in Mobile that everywhere is better than here. That's a, that, that negative attitude about everything we do, if we get football in South Alabama, somebody got a problem with that. If, if we land a new company, somebody got a problem with that. We, you know, I just don't understand how we can be so negative about where we live. I would like to see a positive attitude by our community like I see other areas. You know, and I, I don't subscribe to Mobile is not as good as any other city. I think it is. I think it's better than Mobile. In fact, I think it would be much better than that if we just believed in Puerto Rico. Right. I think it's that I think is a real, real issue for us. And, and more importantly, I think we have to start investing in our own city rather than spending all our money in New Orleans or 
and Miami. <laughs> Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. What do you feel is the most important issue that a solved would improve the city of Mobile? And if there, how would you go about solving it? I think the most serious issue has to do with the city not growing and the underlying reasons why it's not growing, which I've already articulated about crime, not being business friendly with the small businesses, the quality of life, and the, um, and the education system. Um, the fiscal challenges that we have will never be addressed until we can grow the city and have people living in, this, in, in the city limits. And they've got to feel good about it. And I, I just know that that can change. And it does make a change in mindset. But it only comes about, that change in mindset only starts when you start to see positive examples of things are improving. And that's got to start in the mayor's office. And once the, uh, the population of the, the citizens of Mobile realize that real change is coming to improve the quality of life, then they won't be want to leave somewhere else. And that will solve the problems as far as our financial problems as long as we allocate the money in the right area. I also think that we have got to focus on hiring local companies. You know, years ago, 1985, there was a uh, city ordinance saying that 15 percent of all city business or contracts needed to go to the economically and socially disadvantaged. You know, that is not something that we've been doing. And so recently, the city council uh, passed a uh, thing that we want to do a disparity study. Oh my gosh, the last time we did one was 1991. Why do we have to do a disparity study to recognize that we have not reached out to the minority businesses and given them their fair share of businesses going on in Mobile? That is something that we have got to do. Uh, by doing that, then they will feel a part of the city and they, they will help it grow because they are part of the city. Thank you. I left the spirit of study within the year 2000. And uh, that disparity study did show that there were a lot of issues as it relates to everyone being involved in uh, what we do in the community. And it's something that we need to embrace, everyone being involved. Uh, this whole thing about a rising tide with all boats, they don't live with it, they're not in the war. So we, we need to make sure that everybody is able, able to be involved. But th let me just say this. The city is going to grow. It's going to prosper. We're going to have people coming back to the city. We're going to have a lot of amenities. Whether we believe it or not, we're going to have that. And I'm confident of that. And all we need to do is believe in where we are and where we're going. The new question, this was asked by Cassie Callaway. What are your top three projects you would like to see funded with the BP Deepwater Horizon restoration dollars? Well, since that came from Casey Callaway, I know what answer she's looking for. Let <laughs> uh, me give you a little background about uh, my environmental background. My grandfather helped create or helped start the Mobile County Wildlife Federation caused the water quality in Mobile Bay to be deteriorated. And then I've also been real involved in the Alabama Wildlife Federation. I've been delegate to the National Wildlife Federation. So when it comes to the environmental uh, issues, uh, I am very concerned about it, especially when it deals with uh, Mobile Bay and the quality of, of water. So, you know, I certainly think that one of the things that has got to happen is that and why we haven't done it until now, is that we've got to, first off, it would be nice to stop the litter of the streets so it never gets in the way. <laughs> so that it never gets in three miles deep and ends up out of the bay. It's really too late you know, at that point. And that would take a mindset of people working together. But we have some, uh, some uh, uh, mobilians that are living about the litter of the city 
and I think if we just turn on loose, they'll help solve that problem. <laughs> but you, obviously we need the litter traps, we need the oyster reefs, we need to do those things uh, to focus on making sure that Mobile Bay is returned to the quality that it was in years past. What are your top three projects you would like to see funded with the BP Deepwater Horizon Restoration Dollars? Uh, certainly we have some environmental projects that we have to invest in the city. And they are some projects that have really regional significance. And one of those projects has to do with us protecting waterways, and, and that is something that we're working on now. In fact, we just bought a new litter trap for the dog, for the dog with the brain uh, But there are some other areas that we must deal with. One of them being, I'd like to see us be able to match federal money to be able to bridge to stop that backup in the tunnels on here because of this project. That is getting farther and farther down the interstate 10 every month. We are back to Virginia Street now with the bank. And what it does is it hurts our children, it hurts people wanting to come through a mobile on interstate 10 because they don't know another option. When they do find another option, how we ignite it, then they block the entire downtown on Thursdays and Fridays. And we need to address that issue. But I think that one of the key issues for the restore at one is environmental mitigation. So certainly those projects will, will take some priority in it. Uh, I happen to serve on that committee, and I know that the committee has a real interest in that. And there's another topic also for environmental that we're not dealing with. So there are a lot of other regional significant projects like that bridge that's for Mobile and Baltimore County, not just for Mobile, for Mobile and Baltimore County, that we need to address. But as of today, no specific project has been delivered to the bridge. We've not got a project because we've not started accepting projects. We don't know how much money we're going to be getting, and we don't know when we're going to get it. This is our last question, and it goes to Mr. Mayor as well. And you touched on it. It's also by Casey Callaway. How do you propose to handle the stormwater problems plaguing the city of Mobile? We're in that process right now. We uh, have a stormwater plan that's being implemented that we had to formulate with ADM with the approval of EPA. Uh, that plan is in the implementation, implementation stages. Uh, we are aware of what those issues are. We know we have to address those issues. Uh, we are actually spending a lot of time and resources to address those issues right now. And I suspect we will continue to address those really for a number of years because we have so many outfalls and we have to actually do an inventory of all of them and determine what we have to do to make those outfalls work properly and also make sure that they are not running runoff that shouldn't be into the water stream, into the watershed. So that is a project that we have to do, we're required to do it anyway uh, by evening. How do you propose to handle the stormwater problems plaguing the city of Mobile? I would begin by saying it's a shame that we're where we are when it comes to stormwater. Uh, maybe one of the biggest uh, black eyes uh, at City Hall today has to do with stormwater. Um, Mobile is the only city, I think, in the state where we outsource the monitoring of stormwater, where we're not doing it internally. Uh, in our company, we have, we've been monitoring stormwater, so I'm very familiar with what it takes to do it. There's absolutely no reason for the talent and the quality of people we have at City Hall that they can't do it in-house. We recently fined $475,000 because we couldn't get our stormwater program together. When you take what we're paying to have it done outside, and what we've been fined, that's a million dollars that you just, we've just split up a million dollar bill and burned it up. So when we say that the city is operating efficiently and we can't do any better, 
But just think about those kinds of things. So we need to move the strong water management inside the city. We need to handle it ourselves. And you know, ADM and EPA don't play. If you don't do what they say, they, it's going to cost you. And so, you know, I start off from the frame of reference is that we're going to abide by the stormwater runoff laws that's put, that are put out by the year. Let me just say, we have not paid any enforcement $75,000. We're not paying that. Because we have already put together a program and ADM has approved the program and that is not going to happen. In order to remove a consultant, you have to hire complete staff to do that, which is in excess of a half million dollars if we did that. And those folks would just do that. You have to hire engineers, you have to hire employees, and at a point now where we have a hiring freeze on all of those, we can't possibly do that. If we did that, we'd never be able to give our other employees a raise, which we do plan to do. Regardless of what anybody thinks about it, we do plan to give our employees some salary adjustment within this next budget. We should reach the end of the question period. Now that we'll have closing remarks, Mayor Jones will go first, and like we've done up until now, he has the opportunity to bank any of his time. You have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. As we all aware, our city's progress it is doing better now than it's done since I've been in the uh, I hear people talk about the good old days. I was here, I don't know where they were. <laughs> These are the good old days. In Mobile, and we should take advantage of it. We have, and this campaign is not about, in this election, it's not about promises. It's about performance. It's about what's being done, what has been done. The thing that I hope, big believe in, is that we ought to talk about what we have done, and we ought to talk about what our positions have been on important issues in the past. It's a good indication of what we'll do in the future. I think that we need to look at that very closely and look at what has brought us to where we are. If you like what you're seeing in terms of progress, then we have to support our campaign. If you like the growth and development that you see on the horizon in our community, we ask you to support our campaign. If you would like to see every person in the world benefit from the growth and the progress of taking place in this community, that's what our campaign is all about. If you'd like to see us be one of the top cities in this country based on what we have done and what we're doing. The good thing about checking out records is everybody knows what you've done. Nobody knows what you're doing. And the reason I like for us to check our records is a known fact. We can make our mouth say anything. But the truth is the It's what you have done, what you are doing now, what the future holds, that's what it's all about. You know, I've heard political rhetoric a long time. And I've heard people say, well, I'm going to do that, but I can't tell you until I get down there and find out. But I'm down there and I know what's down there. And we're in a position to be one of the greatest cities in this country. We're in a position to see a growth pattern that's just unparalleled for our community. But you can't do it by talking about it. You got to get out there and do it. You have to roll up your sleeves to be mad at this city as a blue collar job. There ain't no ceremonial job. You have to roll up your sleeves and make something happen every day. That's how we got to where we are. That's why Air Bus is here. That's why Tissus Crook is here. That's why all of us go here. It took a lot of work. It didn't happen by itself. I had to do a lot of work. And whoever is there has to do a lot of work.
who joined me here this evening, the success of a city rises and falls with the leadership ability of its mayor. A true leader has a vision that creates improvement for everyone. A true leader unites and does not divide. And a true leader accepts responsibility and doesn't blame others for circumstances. After you elect me mayor, and if there are problems in the city, I am responsible. If there are problems in the parks or the permitting system, I am responsible. If we have an empty cruise terminal, I am responsible. If the mayor are not working together as a team, I am responsible. And if a New York uh, reporter writes that we're the third most familiar city, I am responsible. And if the high school graduation rate is less than 80%, I am responsible. And if the crime statistics are being falsely reported, I am responsible. I am not new to accepting responsibility. I have done it all of my life. I've been solving problems all of my life. And I'm not new at casting bold visions all of my adult life. I've done it in business, I've done it in civic organizations, and I've done it at schools. Looking back over the last eight years, I asked you, <coughs> Is your neighborhood safer? Do you feel safer? Is the quality of life improved in our city or in your neighborhood? And do you really think that City Hall is operating in optimum efficiency? If not, then we are not ready to take advantage of the opportunities that will come with airbus. And today, I stand ready to leave Mobile from being good to great. To become the safest, most business and family friendly city in America by the year 2020. If we embrace this vision, then we put a stop to Mobile becoming a city in decline. Just imagine how many lives we will save while we're doing this, how many violent crimes we will prevent by doing it, and how many jobs that we can create through small business growth. Imagine our city where young people don't live, leave, and where the young people from other communities come here to live because of our quality of life and our jobs. Imagine the city, imagine our city being a place where we can live, work, and play, and pray together as one being. We all want beautiful parks. We all want a vibrant and growing arts community. We want roadways with bike paths. And we want to make sure that our infrastructure is not permanent. So over the next six weeks, I'm going to earn your vote. And I would just ask, for you to vote for me on August 27th. And in doing so, you will have voted for the person with the most passion and the most commitment that will unite our city so that all will be in some part of this community. Thank you.